Oh, hello. It's me, Kevin Alcuni, a librarian here in the Exploration and Creativity Department at the Los Angeles Public Library. And I'm here to welcome you to today's LA Made Ask Me Anything with the NASA Scientist. First, we'd like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our behind the scenes staff for helping bring the LA Made programs to you virtually. Thanks, Steve and Diane. LA Made focuses on the diverse landscape of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. If you'd like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit our online calendar at lapl.org slash events. Oh, right there. And for our LA Made program, specifically visit lapl.org slash LA Made. Our website also has blog posts, video links, and all other kinds of fun things that highlight the library's diverse, diverse resources and upcoming programs. But now on to today's program, AMA with the NASA Scientist. Put my shuttle here. And giving this presentation today will be my friend, Kim Sandu. Kim is an aerospace engineer and scientist at the Armstrong Flight Research Center, where she is the operation safety lead for SOFIA. S-O-F-I-A, and that stands for the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. Um, it's my understanding that it's the world's only flying telescope, and I believe they just recently discovered the, the universe's first molecule. Uh, prior to her work on SOFIA, Ms. Sandu spent 20 years in jet and rocket engine flight research, working on several airframe, airframes, including the F-15, the F-16, the F-18, and the SR-71 aircrafts. She began her career in ballistic missile research for the Air Force Rocket Propulsion Lab at Edwards Air Force Base, where she calculated the ballistic trajectory of missiles and rockets using the calculations created by Katherine Johnson of Hidden Figures movie fame at the NASA Langley Flight Research Center. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and a Master's of Science degree in Aerospace Engineering from Cal Poly Technic State University, Pomona. But before we bring her out, we're gonna play a short video that shows Sophia the telescope that we're about to take a tour of. This video was produced by PBS and PBS Terra Video. Hit it, Steve. Today, I'm going on a mission to find the first molecule in the universe. We wanna know, how did chemistry begin in the universe? And how did it lead to all the molecules we have today? And for that, we need NASA and a modified jumbo jet. Oh, this is great. Packed with one of the most unique telescopes on the planet. All right, y'all, it's 6 a.m. And on my way to NASA, I have a serious bed here, so I'm gonna have to take care of that at some point. I'm gonna get to go inside the Sophia aircraft. Oh man, I'm so excited for that. <laughs> I've come to Palmdale, California to meet with the Sophia mission team. This is amazing. They use this modified Boeing 747 to study the universe. Oh, this is great. So this is what makes the Sophia Observatory so special. It's our 17-ton telescope. This is actually half of the telescope. The other half is on the other side of the pressure bulkhead. Sophia which stands for the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, is designed to observe infrared light. That is light at a wavelength invisible to the human eye. By studying it, they have been able to detect things like water on the sunlit surface of the moon, celestial magnetic fields, and even find the first type of molecule in the universe. Yeah, it's an exciting project to be on for sure. While Arlo got to travel to visit the SOFIA mission, I caught up with SOFIA project scientist Nassim Rangwala. First of all, I want to start off by saying how extremely excited I am to talk to you. I'm just a space nut. <laughs> <laughs> when people think NASA, they don't think chemistry. I mean, like, ex explain yeah. yourself here. Right, so for us, space is a laboratory. But we don't have beakers or test tubes. What we need is a telescope and an instrument with the capability of detecting unique uh, chemical fingerprints of molecules. But what exactly is the benefit of having this telescope on a plane? There is water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere that absorbs this infrared light coming from space and preventing us from studying it on Earth. 
So you either have to be in space or in the stratosphere where Sophia flies. But unlike space telescopes, a plane returns back to Earth after every flight. And its equipment can be swapped out. This means that different instruments can be built, modified, and improved in order to tackle specific scientific tasks. The instrument that you see inside there uh, detects the magnetic fields around the galaxies or the stars that we can view up in the, up in the sky. And one of the key instruments for studying chemistry in space is this a spectrometer. So the light from the telescope goes into this four optics. When the light comes in, it's almost like it goes through a prism. It kind of gives you a rainbow color. And by breaking up the light that enters the telescope in this way, the spectrometer can analyze the frequency of light it's seeing. And that can tell scientists what molecules are present. Molecules can rotate, vibrate, they have different kinds of motion. And when they do that, um, they either emit light or they can absorb light but they emit and absorb at very specific frequencies. It's unique to individual molecules. That is the craziness of these instruments. You know, like, you know, we can not only just look at a picture, but determine what's outside that's, that's millions and billions and billions of miles away, you know, uh, just by looking at the light. It was using a spectrometer like this one that in 2019, Sophia reported the detection of something incredible the first type of molecule in the universe. After the Big Bang, the first two types of atoms to form were hydrogen and helium. A hydrogen ion joined with helium to make helium hydride. Scientists had speculated for decades that this could be the first molecule in the universe. Only problem was, we had never seen this molecule occurring naturally. And though it can be created in a lab, it is so unstable that it doesn't last long. This is why scientists turned their attention to parts of the galaxy that have similar conditions to the early universe. Even though we say this is the first molecule that formed the universe, we cannot go back that far in, in the history of the universe to the very beginnings to, to look for this molecule. So what can we do instead? We can look, in a, look at an astronomical object that would have the right conditions or similar conditions for us to find this molecule. Scientists decided to point the telescope at a planetary nebula 3,000 light years away, called NGC 7027. And this planetary nebula, it had exactly those right conditions. It has very intense ultraviolet radiation and it's very hot. In order to pick up helium hydride's molecular signature, scientists use the GREAT instrument. I mean, literally, that's what they call it. German receiver for astronomy at terahertz frequencies. Before being installed on the SOFIA aircraft, the GREAT instrument had been recently upgraded and finely tuned to be able to detect the specific invisible infrared frequency of helium hydride. Just like you want to tune your radio to your favorite FM station, the scientists tuned it to the frequency that they expected this molecule to be, and they saw it. Decades of search was finally coming to end. The fact that it exists in space and that we have clearly detected it in space in this planetary nebula allows us to have confidence in our theory of the early universe. So what happened in the early universe? How did the first molecule come to be? And how did it lead to all the molecules we see today? 13.8 billion years ago, the universe began with the Big Bang. At first, our universe was just a hot soup of plasma. It was in this hot mess, around 100,000 years after the Big Bang, that helium and hydrogen could come together to form helium hydride, the dawn of chemistry. And subsequently, it started the, um, the, 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 probably the chemical reactions that were needed to continue to form molecules, and one of them was molecular hydrogen. Once the universe cooled enough for gas clouds to condense, and the first stars ignited, the center of these stars became nuclear furnaces where heavier elements could be forged. In stars, it's very hot and it's very dense. and it allows two hydrogen to fuse together to form helium. That's right, more helium is formed in stars, but it doesn't stop there. As the star evolves, heavier elements will form and we will go into the chain of making carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. 
At the end of their lives, some of these stars exploded in a supernova. During that explosion, you get all these heavier elements, heavier than iron, are made in, in, in that last moment of the star. And all these elements can combine in countless ways to make all the molecules that make our world. Every other world. And even us. And understanding chemistry in space is key to um, knowing our cosmic origins. And 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang, we now have the tools to not only understand chemistry here on Earth, but to understand where it all began. To kind of detect that molecule is, is like finding a, a lost fingerprint. It connects us all the way to almost 13 billion years ago. And uh, that's, that's insane. It's what we do science for. Rather silly question, but I'm, yeah. I'm just I'm just so curious. With the acronym, did you guys first come up? Oh, with I I got to tell you that story. Yeah, all the acronyms, they're actually put into a software to come up with this cool name. No way. Yes. <laughs> cool video, right? All right, so if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. And without any more further waiting or ado, uh, here's Kim. Yay. Hi, Kevin. Hi, thanks for joining us. Well, I'm glad you have me here. Yeah. It's, it's my, absolutely my pleasure. I want to welcome everybody on board, Sophia. I'm sitting here on the main deck. Uh, we are we are working here today, so you may see some folks working around. But he, you know, here we are. You got it, okay? Um, and uh, fire away with the questions. Uh, yeah. Well, do you wanna? Is there anything you wanna point out about the interior that people may not know about? Um, like all of the different seats. How many passengers are normally on the flight when it goes on? You, you know, it varies depending on, we have five science instruments. And so the number of passengers uh, will depend. So it could range anywhere from nine up to uh, 15 or 16. These seats that I'm sitting at here are where the scientists sit. Mm -hmm. And uh, over here, I don't know if you can see it, but this is where our um, uh, directors we have, the, it's basically our mission control. And I'm sitting across from that. Mm -hmm. And they are the ones who let the uh, pilot know how to stay on the course and what we're doing and what we uh, need to see. Open the door. Um, you did see on the video that Sophia is a telescope about the size of the Hubble telescope. And it's in back, in back of me. Mm -hmm. And it uh, has a, what I call a garage door. It opens up and it closes. And that is how we look at, take a look at the night sky. Okay. Um, how long has the program been around for? It's been around since the 90s, actually. But this aircraft here has uh, been flying for about roughly, approximately 10 years doing science. Okay. Um, we're starting to get some listener questions in here. I'll put the first one up and I'll read it to you. Okay. Uh, are you actively analyzing data during flight? Uh, you know, we look at data, well, two ways. We do have data that, that we, that we uh, save to look at after the flight. And we are also looking at information to maintain the proper course headings and to uh, make sure that we are targeting the correct uh, star or the correct cluster or the correct area in the sky. Okay. Um, and I think I've asked you this before, but uh -huh. um, when are the flights taken? When are the flights taken? Yeah. When are the when well, do the flights go off? Yeah. That's actually a good question. As we are stargazing, the flights start at sundown, and they end before sun up. And we fly approximately four flights a week. Okay. Um, and they go from, I'm sorry, and they go from sun down to sun up. Was that correct? Yes. We, we ideally like to have 10-hour flights. 
and the, the, the sometimes they're eight hour flights they vary but and of course the longer flights we get are the ones that we do in the winter time so the way i like to explain it is we overwinter uh we in the northern hemisphere and then mm -hmm. we also have objects in the southern hemisphere and we're, we're flying in their winter which is the, our summer here uh, in the u.s gotcha um all right another question's come in um, it's about the molecule that was discovered. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it, so do your best. Uh, very cool about the new molecule. What are some of the practical uses of the HEH, the helium hydrogen? Um, hmm, I guess maybe what's the practical uses of the knowledge of that? Does, uh, does, does understanding the, or finding the very first molecule in the universe have any uh, sort of Right. And, and, and practically speaking, what we're trying to do is... Um, look at the the beginning, how stars are born, uh, the beginning of the whole, um, e even the history of the universe, how the, um, the, you know, when we look at these things, we're looking at the infrared hmm. and we're also, and in doing so we can see the magnetic fields and those magnetic fields um, and I think they showed some of that in the uh, video mm -hmm. that tells us a lot about star formation hmm. and that's what those and, and part of that evidence are those molecules okay um, another one another question is coming in about Sophia itself uh, do you have to fly? Okay, so you answered one of it. Do you have to fly during certain parts of the day? So you said that, guessing night. But do you fly over the USA or worldwide to try and get the best view? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, yes and yes. And the our flights take us um, out over the Pacific. It takes us um, out east over as far is the Midwest. It just depends on the star that we are looking at. It depends on that point in the sky that we're looking at. And that's here in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, since it is a plane, it is an aircraft, we can deploy in other areas. This year we deployed to Germany and Tahiti. Oh. And we're looking at sites uh, in other areas in Southern Hemisphere. We've also many times have gone to New Zealand so yes, we can deploy at uh, different areas of the world. Uh, and uh, this might sound like a silly question, but what? do you take, <laughs> I mean, I guess all of my questions no are going to seem questions. silly. All right, thank you. <laughs> um, when you take off, I guess you're taking off from the same uh, airport and then landing at the same airport. Is that how it goes or do you? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. yes, we have our home base here in Palmdale. Okay. And we take off and we return back to our home base. Yes. Okay. So it just kind of uh, travels and it, so it, it, it takes off and lands in the same spot though. It doesn't like land and does it land in other airports or does it always come back? Home? Oh, it always, it always comes back. It always comes back. <laughs> uh, and yes, it can land at other airports. It's plain, but it always comes back. I see. Mm -hmm. Um, just looking behind you, what are some of those pictures of Sophia that are on the, uh, above the seats behind you? Are those decorations oh, or are those uh, informative things? I'm a, you know, that, all right. Maybe that was a silly question. No, it is not a silly <laughs> question. That's actually a good question. You know, we, we have this information up for when we have uh, people actually come and visit us. Okay. And though that is actually, uh, it's actually a good question. We have um, images of the types of studies that we do. So you'll see back there, there's images of, you know, what we're looking at as far as star and planet formation, um, what we're doing with organic compounds in space, uh, the black holes, center of the Mil Milky Way. We're looking at atmosphere rings, um, comets, and near-Earth asteroids. All those pictures depict those types of things that we're looking at. Wow. So. Is the black hole a recent phenomenon that has been photographed, or has is, is that been photographed? I know. Okay, it's not recent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. it's not recent. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Let's let's go a little bit into your career, Kim. Uh, can you talk about a little bit about your path towards being an aerospace engineer, um, and just a little bit about how you arrived to where you are now, like the STEM path? 
Oh, okay. Well, I started out before STEM even existed. Mm -hmm. And I was very good, though, at math and science and ended up getting accepted into the University of Tennessee uh, Engineering School okay. in Knoxville, Tennessee. And that's really pretty much where it started from. And what gave me the idea was really, believe it or not, I was a Star Trek fan. And, and I always saw Lieutenant Uhura there. And I just knew young girls could do that. And that, but that's pretty much all I had. <laughs> I did, there was no such thing as STEM. Right. And uh, from there, I, it just it went on from there. Okay. Um, that's so crazy. So the one role model, the one positive role model that was kind of science-based that you saw kind of... Was that a little bit of an inspiration for you, would you say? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. N Nichelle Nichols. Yes. And, and I did get the chance to meet her. Uh, there are several. There's a, actually a video out there of her actually getting to fly on Sophia. Oh, man. So if anybody wants to look, it is out there. Uh, the yeah. other thing I must say is, you know, as far as math and science goes, mm -hmm. I did not have a male math teacher. All All female? All female math teacher from kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade, believe it or not. That's incredible. I only had women as examples, so it never occurred to me that it was a men-only men thing. Right. Uh, my very first math teacher was in college. Male wow. math teacher was in gotcha, college. Gotcha, gotcha. Wow. So it, it just uh, didn't occur to me that that's something I couldn't do. Wow, that's great. Uh, we have another uh, question coming in here. Mm -hmm. um, it's physics teacher, physics teacher here. My students Ooh. and I were wondering if there were any roadblocks he had to go through slash over slash under slash around to get to where you are today. Oh, well, you know, I came, uh, I went to college in the 80s. And so, yeah, you know, obviously the, the big roadblock was being an uh, African-American female going to an uh, all uh, you know, engineering school mm -hmm. in, uh, there in Tennessee. And part of what helped me was that we they had the Minority Engineering Scholarship Program. Mm. And that program helped mentor us, gave us leadership, uh, all of us students. Because, you know, I was one of a handful of women, period, uh, African-American or otherwise, there in the classes. Right. But again, it just... It, never occurred to me that I couldn't do it. I always knew I could do it. So, and that's the biggest, biggest thing is to just know that you can do the work and show them your success is your, your, your thing. That's great. That's great. We have a nice comment here uh, from yeah. Marie. Uh, very informative and interesting information. Love NASA. Your story is very inspirational for other young girls to follow. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So um, another question here, yeah. uh, maybe yeah. if you can try, has any flight ever captured a UFO as you look into the universe? Oh, huh. oh I love it. Well, <laughs> the, the easy answer is no. <laughs> However, we have captured some lovely southern lights. Okay. Do you well, know what that is? I, I don't know. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Uh, have you heard of the Aurora Borealis, oh, yes. the Northern Lights? Okay, mm -hmm. well, they have the Southern equivalent. They're called Southern Lights or um, Aurora Australis. Oh. So we've captured that. Is is that a is that a relatively new phenomenon to capture? Or? Oh, no. Oh, uh, not for Sifi. I mean, we, you, the, that phenomenon has been with the world since the beginning, I'm sure. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but most people don't realize you, well, some people don't realize that it happens both at the North Poles and the Southern Pole. Right. It happens at poles. <laughs> uh, this is the this is the teacher again. Just a comment. Uh, the minority of the minority. Congrats on making it through. Oh, thank you. You know, this is the physics teacher. Yes. I loved physics. I had a blast in physics in college. <laughs> um, all right. What are three things about working for NASA that people would be surprised about? Uh, well, very easy. Very first, Sophia. Most oh. people, you know, you showed your your um, um, shuttle at mm -hmm. the beginning. And most people, when they think of NASA, they think of the shuttle, they think of space, they think of the space station. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't realize that we have what's called in-atmospheric research. And that's what Sophia is part of, is the in-atmospheric research. 
Oh, interesting. Uh-huh. And that's one. The other thing is here in California, most people, when you hear NASA, they think of JPL. Right. And so, but there are two other centers and, and Sophia is part of the two other centers, which is NASA Armstrong and NASA Ames. And um, Armstrong is here in Palmdale. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, oh, actually, fun fact, mm-hmm. NASA Armstrong is where the shuttle used to land when it landed in California. Oh. Yeah. I didn't know that. And that's out in Palmdale, correct? It's out in Palmdale at Edwards Air Force Base, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, has NASA taken any sort of um, interest in uh, documenting uh, the effects of global warming in any way? Is that something that is within their purview of things oh. that they... That you would have to look up. Okay, I just um, because you know we we look at so much with airborne science. I I'm sure there's a lot of information that we have. Gotcha. Out there. And it's up to the scientists. I to, see. To look at the data. Right. Okay. Uh, here's another question. Uh, maybe you can answer it. Yeah. How many times has Sophia flown? Oh, you know what? I should have. <laughs> <laughs> We hit flight 300 some about a year ago. Wow. So it's more than 300 flights for sure. And uh, in other words, I can't give you the exact sure, number. Sure. We're, 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 we're down right now. And I usually start, we're about to start our flights here in another few weeks. And so uh, okay. I, um, I would actually, then I would start clicking back into the number of flights. <laughs> I see. And then I think we talked about this, just me and you for a minute, but how many crews uh, work, Sophia. Is it a rotating crew of pilots? Oh, okay. You're talking about the flight crew. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. We do have a rotating crew because we're doing um, four flights a week. We do have to alternate crews. Okay. Uh, so that you could, uh, so we can work in crew rest. Right. And that is for both the pilots and the scientists. You see, you've got one walking right behind me right now. Oh, I see. And uh, yeah. Yeah, because we're we're in preparation. We're getting ready to get back into the air. We're we're down for maintenance right now. And then, is there any sort of specific training? Because you know, it's an all night schedule, um, uh-huh. and the body clock um, is not used to that kind of work. Is there any kind of training that is done, or is it just kind of a white knuckle it through? You know, I think it's the same as anybody who run who works a night shift. Okay. It's, it's, it's exactly what they do. You just get used to it and then. I that's... believe so. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, you're talking about the circadian rhythm, right? Yeah. yeah just you get the ability yeah. uh, it, it, to, it, it, to yeah. get the deep REM sleep and all that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. A um, couple, a lot of more questions are starting to come in now. Um, <laughs> what is the funnest thing you do at your job? Oh, gosh. There's so much. There is. So just coming up here on onto the deck of the plane. And um, w- one of the fun things was to sit in the cockpit uh, on takeoff. Oh. That, oh, my goodness. That was a blast. <laughs> uh, what would you say that experience is like um, for people who've never, uh, you know, and may probably not get a chance to do something like that? What, um... Well, uh, well, you know, oh, gosh, it's it's just breathtaking, especially when you see the uh, there's one thing to see the sunset. All right. When you are on the ground, mm-hmm. but to see the sunset up in the air, uh, and you can see the curvature of the Earth and right. all the different colors. It's just it is unbelievable. Wow. And it was just such a privilege to be able to see that. that yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that has to be something, you know, a lot, a large segment of population don't really get to experience an an in-air viewing like that. That must be incredible. Right, right, right. From from the front, you know, I I know folks uh, who, for the flying public, who are in the uh, cabin and you can see it from the side, but you get this unending view when you look out of the the cockpit window. Yeah. Um. I think you've answered this before, but we'll go ahead and just put it on again. Uh, How long is the time you spend in the air? Oh, I did answer that. Yes, it is anywhere. uh, We we average around 10 hours in the air. Right. Uh, But here during COVID, it's been closer to eight. Okay. 
but we're ramping back up. It's, so, it's, so, so I like to say between eight and 10 hours. Okay. And mm -hmm. with each particular flight, um, are there specific goals that you're trying to do or is there like, are there like short-term goals and long-term goals with each flight that you're trying to cover or how does the specifics of the flight kind of uh, take shape? Oh, you know, yes, they, they, we do uh, fly legs, what we call different legs. Uh -huh. and each leg has, we typically don't use the terminology goal, but yes, we, gotcha. we have targets in the Yeah, air. yeah, I see. And, and then, so mm -hmm. the different targets would be on the different legs. And, and our goal would be to hit that target for so many minutes at such a certain attitude and all of that. I see. I see. Without and, getting too technical, that, that there are many things that we look for. I in see. The, in the air, yeah. And then are, are things kind of pre-programmed so when you're in that certain uh air space you can mm -hmm. direct this telescope to to make sure to look at certain areas that you're studying it, did, did i ask that right i'm not sure <laughs> like, like when you're like when you're tr like when you're in the atmosphere and the telescope yeah. is is pointed at a specific direction like yeah. are there are there uh, targets that you're trying to capture data for is that kind of oh yeah oh yeah there's there's always targets <clears throat> that we're trying to capture data for okay right um um, what library resources would you recommend people use if they wanted to improve their own uh, kind of uh, STEM education? Are there anything that you think, um, you know, that the library could provide if people wanted to? Oh, even... oh yes, I'm I'm sure there's a, a whole section on STEM, and um, what I did though was give some links, especially when it comes to uh, NASA and educational resources with NASA. Okay, yeah. I think and I think you them. can make those available because, and I believe we put links here in the chat. Yeah, the links are in the chat for anybody who wants to click on the hyperlinks to, right. to the various. See, we, right, we have resources for students and for educators. Hmm. We have uh, an ambassador program where we do bring a handful of educators onto the aircraft mm -hmm. to uh, fly and uh, help with research. Uh -huh. And we do have internships. Okay. So, and all of those are in those on, in those links. Okay. As far uh, as resources. Yeah. Um, can you talk about how the origins of Sophia came about? Who thought of the flying telescope idea? Ooh. History. Um, I don't. You know, of course, Aaron Eric Becklin comes to mind, but uh, he was one of the the men who first really pushed Sophia. That being said, he was not the first. There was an aircraft ahead of us mm -hmm. that was also a flying telescope. And I, you, that's something we would have to Google. You know, <laughs> or ask a librarian. <laughs> or ask a librarian, right, right. Uh, because there, there was an airborne air, um, telescope prior to Sophia. Okay. Uh, was, did it do the same kind of research that Sophia is doing now? Roughly, yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. What does Sophia study? Oh, okay. Well, I could answer that one again. And like I said, remember, there, all of those items on the wall, on the ceiling. <laughs> right. We we study um, star and planet formation, along with the organic compounds. One of the neatest things that we have studied is the moon. Oh. Yes, here, I think it was last year, uh -huh. we turned our telescope towards the moon to look for evidence of water on the sunny side of the moon. Oh, and what would that, what would that knowledge kind of, um, uh, are there any breakthroughs that, that learning something like that would um, kind of expand, um, you know, people's idea of what, what could happen on the moon? What does the discovery of something like that mean? Well, the when we you know we have there's a goal to actually go back to the moon, mm -hmm. and as you know, water is the basis for life. Right. So we're looking for the presence of water, uh, actually both on the moon and on Mars, um, and the belief was that there was only water on the dark side of the moon. Hmm. So to 
find water on the sunlit side of the moon. And mm-hmm. As you know, the moon is tidally locked. I don't know if you know what that is. I but basically, we only see one side of the moon. Oh, okay. That's it. Right. And and so for it to be found on the sun side of the moon means that it, it could pot- potentially be instead of just near the poles, it could be in other areas. Okay. So uh, that's 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 big. That's very big. Wow. Especially if we do want to have people up on the moon. Right, because they would need a source of water in order to see, yeah, right, to right. still stay living. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some somebody wrote here there was the 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 Cooper Kuiper Airborne Observatory. I wonder if that was Coupier. the one that Cooper. That's it. Okay. Yeah. That is it. Well, that is th- it. Thank you, Constance. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, Cooper. That was the, the oh, and for to be clear, that is the one that predates Sophia. Gotcha. Um, here's another listener question. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you're reading these because I I can't see them. No problem. Happy, ha- happy <laughs> to help. Um, <laughs> what is the most breathtaking Sophia discovery? Oh, we've had so many, so many. But top I three. <laughs> top three. I can give you the top one is that moon. That, oh, the that's water. That's a big one. The water. The water and the moon. And um, I think they also mentioned the the molecule. Right. Right, right, right. So those were the, the the top ones, and we've got some stunning photos of um, the magnetic fields, and say, for instance, Orion uh, constellation, some of the other constellations that I think you can find online. That it's just it, it's amazing, and and someone even did a, a side by side picture of. The magnetic field next to Van Gogh's Starry Night, and it looks so much oh. like that picture. It was it was just unbelievable. And and if I'd had a chance, I would have printed it out and shown it to you. But uh, that is out there, I believe. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I know we talked a little bit earlier about your path to becoming an aerospace engineer, but uh, from from college, how did you kind of um, how did your career trajectory kind of move into the next phase from, from, from after college? How did you uh-huh. kind of break in? Oh, um, during college, actually, I was a NASA co-op at NASA Marshall. Okay. And a co-op is a student and a college student who, is, who applies and then gets a chance to work at the engineering outfit of their choice. I picked NASA Marshall. Okay. Um, there are different other choices that you can make, but that's actually how I got to first work for NASA. And when I came out of college, mm-hmm. uh, as actually about a month and a half uh, after I left college, uh, the chal- that's when the Challenger accident happened. So oh, I, I ended up waiting almost four and a half years before I had another chance to uh, apply to NASA. And I, I applied and I uh, was accepted to work. Oh to work at NASA. So um, I've been here now almost 30 years. Yeah. Wow. What's the, uh, what's an application to apply to NASA? Like, I I don't think a lot of people know about that. It's called USA jobs. Is it .gov? Oh, maybe. Yeah. Uh It's, but it's USA jobs. And then they just, and you, cause you know, everything's gone online. Every, everything's online now. I, you know, normally folks would say, Hey, here's my resume. Right, but oh, well, well, that's the old, old-fashioned way. It's it is all online now. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, but for you, was there like, uh, was there any sort of test or? Uh, oh no, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it was just a regular job application, actually. And they they just and then you just yeah, and of course that was that if you you actually did turn in a, a paper resume it was just that long ago it was not done online but these days everything's done online okay so there's no like math test or science test or a a, a way to uh, kind of test your abilities kind of thing <laughs> uh no actually they uh they assume you've gotten all of that in college they you you do all your testing and all of that in college right mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm. um 
yeah, I don't see too many other questions right now coming through. Um, um, is there anything visually that you can kind of show us about um, anything else about Sophia that you can kind of point us to with the camera or is it kind of a limited? Um, let's see. What, you know what? It's because it's kind of difficult to move in here. Like I said, I could show you, I could stand up. Okay. I'm going to hold the cord. Sure. Very carefully. I'm going to stand up. Okay. And, uh, you know, okay, so two things. Let's oh. see if I can get to it. It is kind of, I can't move too far. Gotcha. All right, you see that blue ring in the back there? Yeah. What is that? That is where we place the science instrument. That's ah. the telescope arm. On the other side of that wall is mm -hmm. the actual physical telescope. Okay. So I'm standing inside of the area that is um, where everybody sits. Okay. And uh, is uh, then on the other side, the telescope is open to the, uh, the atmosphere. So, okay. oh, wow. You know what? It looks like everybody's gone. Okay. So I may actually be able to drop my mask. <laughs> All right. Because they were working, but yeah. I can't go too much further, though. I, but th okay, that's yeah. one of the things that you can have is, that you see here is the bulkhead. Um, and around on the other corner is, I always, I always just thought this was the niftiest thing in the whole wide world, is a, we have a sign there uh, along this, this wall here that says this is the distance that the Wright brothers first flew. Oh, <laughs> and their first flight was less than, uh, or a little bit more than half of the length of this aircraft. Oh wow, <laughs> that so, is crazy! So, the, yeah, their flight it, was half the length of the size of your the airplane. Very first Wright Brothers flight, yes. That is and an interesting. Someone fact. went through the trouble of putting a placard up uh against the wall to to point that out i thought that was just the niftiest thing in the world <laughs> i was like because you don't you don't think about it you don't think oh, that yeah. their first flight is shorter than the length of a modern airplane yeah wow that's bananas what are some of those instruments behind you those pan uh those blue screens um over mm -hmm. on your yeah oh that is um part of uh, what the scientists are looking at right now, they're, they're working on the um, software, or at least they were. I think they're gone now. Okay. Like I, said, I could, I, I'm, I'm by myself here now. So. Okay. Yeah, there you and, go. Ooh, the big reveal. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, a couple of new questions have come in. Yes. Uh, let's see here. Uh, do you did you pick the right field of work for you, or have you ever wondered about other fields of work that you may have pursued? <gasps> that is a great question. I actually went to uh, school, to the university, to be a artist. Oh, what? <laughs> an artist, yes. Yes, I went to be an artist and to dance. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and then yeah. you work at NASA. <laughs> and now I work at NASA. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. How did that, yeah. how did that turn happen? It just... Uh, you know, I, I literally was... Uh, great at math and science and I got there to the university and my aunt took me to talk to some engineers. She was like, no, you're good at math and science. You're going to talk to these engineers. So okay. she, she's the mentor that turned me around. Oh, gotcha. And, and I, you know, in the back of my head, I also had my math and science teachers who were just fussing in my senior year time. Like, Why are you going into art? You're great at this stuff. <laughs> and so, I mean, I'd already been told that I, I already knew. So right. that's, that's how, but yeah, no. Um, and let me tell you, I've met several other, uh, or I know several other female engineers and that, yeah, I've, I've got one that she was going into fashion design and no kidding. And she's now a PhD in engineer. Wow. So yeah. Yeah. The, the person who asked that question just commented, uh, that is quite the pivot. <laughs> That is quite the pivot, but you would be surprised. A lot of my coworkers, they, they, oh gosh, they draw beautifully. They uh, are photographers. They do all kinds of artsy fartsy stuff. I mean, oh. just, yeah, a lot of our, my coworkers do. So, so a lot of that left believe brain it creativity. That, but you know, that's why they call it steam now. That's why they threw that A in the oh, STEM. Oh, right, for the arts. Because it's, it's really not that different. Hmm. 
using it, creativity it, it, in a different way. Right. You're just using creativity in a different way. That's yeah, all. yeah. All right. Uh, here's another question about Sophia. Um, how many people work on the plane, uh, I guess work in the plane while it's in the air? How, I guess I guess what's the size of maybe the flight crew and maybe the scientists as well? Oh, yeah. Like I said, it, it depends. We have five instruments. Uh -huh. And uh, each instrument takes a different crew complement, so it could range anywhere from nine up to fifteen or sixteen people, uh -huh. and that actually includes the pilots. Gotcha. And yeah. do they do they have like nap breaks or meal breaks during the flight, um, or is it? Well, well yes, we we do take not necessarily nap breaks, but uh, meal breaks. Gotcha. Sure. We all in and, and with COVID, they alternate. Okay. Um, because we all wear masks when we're all inside. Uh, you know, like I said, now I'm by myself, but uh, so I could uh, drop the mask. But, right. Uh, mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Um, I'm still tripping out on uh, the number of people who had different uh, creative creative outlets that kind of moved into the math and science world. It, it, it's not something I feel is commonly thought of when people think of like people working for NASA, but coming from um, maybe not a science background per se in the beginning, but just pivoting towards that. Um, it's pretty interesting. I haven't really, I, it's it's nothing that wouldn't have occurred to me before. So that's, that's yeah, really I'm, interesting. I'm not the first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the first. Wow. And, and you know what? It's, it's actually a good question because I thought I was the first. I thought I was unique. And then I started talking <laughs> to all these scientists and they're like, oh, no, no, I, I used to paint. I used to draw. I, yeah, it's it's very, very um, interesting. And it's not unique. Mm -mm. Wow. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, it looks like we don't have too many other questions right now i don't know are there any are there any things about sophia that you kind of you feel like um, we haven't covered or talked about that um well i have here let's see well two things so one is how high does sophia fly oh yeah i can i can ask that okay and it flies between thirty nine thousand to forty four thousand feet and uh to give you kind of a comparison yeah yeah your average cross-country flight travels at about 35,000 feet. Okay. Uh, just inside of the stratosphere. Oh, I just saw somebody go by. Okay, so I got to put my mask back on. Okay. Um, but, uh, oh, he's gone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I did not see him back there. And um, it's about a couple of miles above. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Um, this does it, it so it flies higher than like a domestic flight? Is that kind of it, it flies a couple of uh, miles higher than in up into the stratosphere? Okay, uh, and again, why are we up in the stratosphere? Because in order to see in the infrared range, we need to be above most of the water vapor in the air, and um, that puts us basically up at you know, above 40,000 feet. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are are the pilots uh, different in any way? Or are they just, I mean, not, I don't want to say regular, but do they have special training in, in any kind of ways? They're the same. They, 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 all our pilots, uh, well, all pilots, all, because this is a commercial aircraft, so all pilots have the same training. They have the same training as all the uh, the other pilots in the I gotcha. for commercial aircraft. Okay. Because uh, this air, airplane originally was in um, a actual commercial right, uh, right. aircraft okay. flying a route. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Fly, actually, you know, flying. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Diane has a question here. Uh, is Sophia kept inside a hangar when not in use or is it ever left outside? Oh, okay. It stays in a hangar. <laughs> we keep it. We hanger it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it can sit outside, but we hanger it. Gotcha. You know, and I think I asked this before, but what is the temperature inside the airplane when it's up that high? Is it pretty cold? You know what you did ask, but you know, the, the cabin is pressurized, uh -huh. but we do need to keep uh, the instrument cool. Matter of fact, we, we keep it cold. Okay. And which keeps the temperature down much lower 
mm-hmm. in the cabin. So um, it's you, you're it's cold. It, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, the the scientists wear uh, heavy jackets, warm jackets. I got you. And I and I think I told you when I flew, I um, I have a heated jacket. Right, because it, it I mean, because it's cold for ten hours. It's not yes. just for a little. <laughs> yes, they call that cold soaking. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um. All right, got another one here. Uh, maybe you said this already, but what are your most challenging tasks when working on Sophia? Oh, what are your most challenging tasks working on Sophia? Like, I guess, what are the some of the difficulties of working on a traveling telescope or flying telescope? Oh. You, oh gosh, it's, you know, it's just like, I think of it as like traveling with your family, (laughs) which, you know, gives an image. Sure, sure. And I'm not even, and I actually not even talking people, I'm just talking, you know, Sophia, where um, we have to arrange, you know, all the things, the cryogens and whatnot to keep the instruments cold. Mm -hmm. We have to pack the plane. Hmm. I, I think I told you, you know, one night, you know, I was out we were putting things into the cargo hold. You, you, so, so when you're traveling, you got to pack everything. Right. When you get there, you got to unpack, get everything settled and then do your work. Right. And then pack it all back up wow. and bring it all back home and then unpack. <laughs> and, and then, and of course, you know, clean and wash and the whole thing. I see. That is a lot of, but tasks. we're doing it on this scale. Right. With a plane, yeah. Are uh, are a lot of checklists used for stuff like that? Is that is that like oh, a, yes. a tool that's regularly utilized? Oh, yes, yes. Um, is mm-hmm. that constantly updated, or is it kind of? Um... um, we've been doing this now for for many, many, many years. So gotcha. our checklists have stabilized. Okay. It's, it's it's pretty much the same checklist now. But yeah. That's interesting. But that is a regular tool that you use to make sure that everything Ooh, is. Yeah. <laughs> that was something I read yeah. in a book a long time ago that uh, in order yeah. to uh, help yourself, uh, checklists are one of the easiest ways to just kind of verify that everything that needs to be there mm-hmm. is there. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, we're, we, we have, a lot of this equipment is heavy. Sure. So we have to make sure that you know we've got forklifts and lift lifts and man lifts and you know, it to whenever we we move things. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, here's another one about Sophia. Uh, did you mention the speed that Sophia can fly at? Oh, um, I, don't, I don't think I have. I think I said the altitude, and that would get you. Um, we do speeds and knots, four hundred, five hundred. Oh. Uh, well, okay. Here's the easy way. Sure. <laughs> Most of your 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 transcontinental aircraft, mm-hmm. Sophia is one of them. Okay. Flies at Mach point eight, and oh. so it's it's uh, subsonic. Okay. And a Mach is around seven hundred and fifty miles per hour. So we're we're looking at at between five and six hundred miles per hour. Okay. Okay. Is and that, the higher you go, the faster you go. So, oh, uh, yeah. is that is there less wind resistance the higher you go? Kind of idea. Oh, I wouldn't say that. It's just um, that's the the dynamics of, of flight. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is why I'm asking. This is an AMA. Ask me anything. <laughs> Ask anything. So, so yeah, it, we we would go uh, the same speed as a cross country flight, but a little faster because because uh, you're cause at a higher. Yeah, we're at the higher altitude. Okay. Yes. Um, and then here's another one. Um, has Sophia ever taken damage? Taken damage? I guess, or been damaged? I, I don't know. No, I guess. I don't think so. No, no. <laughs> Fortunately? Fortunately, yeah, no. Yeah, we know. This is, this is our baby. We treat her with kid gloves and, and no. Yeah, I guess like, and I guess you wouldn't, you would, you would not fly if the, if the, um, the atmosphere or the weather or anything could cause anything like that as well, right? That's exactly. all Exactly. You know, part of our team is the our weatherman. Okay. We have a weatherman. And, okay. And weather lady. Gotcha. Oh, right. And we don't move unless we have a good, long, hard talk with him. And, you know, is there is there ex- to excess turbulence? Is there gotcha. anything going on? Um, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. wow. And that's yeah. dedicated just for Sophia? 
Uh, oh, oh, uh, your, your weather the, woman. Or weather people? Yeah, I mean. You know what? But it's the the all of our airborne science aircraft. Gotcha, use gotcha. The uh, weather people. Yeah, oh, that's great. You know, of course. Yeah. It, now that question, you say, yeah. It, yeah. Now they think about. It, I'm like, oh yeah, of course they would use weather, but it, it yeah. just never. Um, okay. <laughs> Here's yeah, a. Yeah. A somewhat silly question, and they label it that way. Might be a silly question, but have any pets been on Sophia? No, <laughs> it's not a silly. No, it's not a silly question, and no, we haven't had any pets. <laughs> <laughs> I guess with a lot of the instruments, you would have to be careful for any sort of um, just uh, extra things going on. That's that's what I'm imagining. Oh, right, right, right. We yeah, because we don't want anything loose or right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Right, right, right. Well, we're we're just about at the end of um the program. Is there anything else about Sophia that we didn't cover or uh, you want to share? I you know what? No, I think I other than it's just been an amazing program. It is the most u- unique and uh fantastic program to work on. I have enjoyed every bit of it. And uh, you know, as a, as it is a, as a African American female engineer, and right. the, the opportunity has just been an amazing blessing. Uh, but there was one thing that's kind of non Sophia, and sure. I wanted to give a little pitch for, and that is for those of us who want to stay firmly on the ground, you can always go to the Griffith Observatory if you want to do some observing. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, there are those options, or your your homemade at home uh, telescope. <laughs> Always look to the nice guy. I have one. I have a star map. I look out every night. Okay. Wow, uh, really? Every night? And I just, do. Oh, yeah, so I nice. do. <laughs> um, I do. Oh, okay. One last question's come in, and then I think we'll take this last one. Okay. Um, does having... Oh, interesting. So I guess they're talking about the flight. Does having an open hole create any flight? I think they're imagining... The hole where the the telescope might be. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And and that took years of um, not only research but study uh, to make sure that the aircraft stayed airworthy when we opened the door. Oh. Because yes, you are uh, interrupting the flow. Right. Of the air around the aircraft. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So that's a good question. So, and so, yes, they really um, worked the design to minimize uh, the flow and still have a safe aircraft. Right. And still have a telescope back there. Right. And still be able to observe. And I, I can't remember. I think the, uh, the little video that you showed at the beginning, but we also have ways to keep the telescope steady. Oh, okay. Because the airplane is dynamic. Right, is right, right. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. I think... I'm going to put this back on now. Okay. <laughs> I think that's it, Kim. Um, okay. I just want to thank you so much. Or I'll let oh. you. I'll let you get settled in you for a minute. Settle back in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and uh, hold on. Sure. No problem. You are most welcome. All right. Well, thank you so much. This was awesome and super enlightening. And I hope all the viewers had a chance to just get any of their science questions that they wanted asked. Well, so. uh, I'm glad, again, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> and uh, anytime, ask any questions. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Oh. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much for joining us for today's LA Made program. And remember to check out the library's online calendar at lapl.org slash events. And don't forget to check out our next amazing LA Made program, An Afternoon with the amazing with the with the award-winning writer TC Boyle. Join us for an afternoon with best-selling writer TC Boyle as he discusses his latest novel, Talk to Me. He'll be joined by librarian Karen Pickford Four as they discuss Bonobo's books and whatever else comes to mind. And that will be next Thursday, October 21st at 4 p.m. Okay, until next time, we truly appreciate all your support. The success of LA Made and all of our library programs could not happen without viewers like you. So thank you. you. And we're gonna fly this ship.